Hello friends, welcome again. I hope you're thriving, I hope your practice is doing well. Uh, today I'm going to talk about two topics and uh, one is the topic of sexuality, sexual misconduct, the precept of uh, refraining from sexual misconduct. And the second one, if I've got time and, and if I get to it, um, I want to talk about the identity box, what I call the identity box. So let's get into it. So the first thing about <clears throat> sexual misconduct is firstly to start to understand what sexual sexuality is, like what, what is it for, uh, what is what is its its role in our lives and, and, and you know and, and what, what what's the nature of sexuality. And when we go to the bi we we start from the biological and then we get into the mental. All right, we get into the the mental side of it, but there's biological things going on, as we know from science and uh, having an, a um, a history of science in my in my background. <clears throat> you know, there's hormones, there's biological things that going on, and then of course there's the mental aspects of sexuality, right? Like who you're attracted to and all these kind of things. But the question is, is what is sexuality all about? And what is the act of intimacy supposed to be about, right? If it is not for copula you know, uh, producing more humans, uh, is it meant for fun and all these other kind of things? And this is something that I'm not going to answer. There's something you've got to answer. You've got to find the answer yourself, right? I've worked it out for myself, and I, I believe personally um, I have a view on it, <clears throat> but I'm not going to share that. I'm not going to share that because <clears throat> I think these days um, when you talk about these things that are uh, that are personal, uh, can, they can be misconstrued and taken out of context. And because this is the internet and this is videos, there's certain personal things that I just don't wish to put up on the internet about what I think about certain things. Now, of course, I had a past before becoming a monk and... Uh, I grew up like any other person, I guess, went to school and all, did all these kind of things, um, you know, and I had passed, I was married and, and I had kids and all those kind of things. So, I mean, that's out there. Um, so that's not real. that's kind of public information. So I'm not, but don't ask me any personal details about my family and things like that, because I, I you know, they're irrelevant to, they're irrelevant on this channel and they're irre irrelevant to my life right now. But if you're asking, yes, I do talk to my family. So, um, and I do have relationships and uh, with my children and things like this. But as a monk, uh, since I've ordained as a monk, um, you know, my life has been nothing but um, sober and strict and full of discipline and, um, you know, focused on the goal. But sexuality is a big thing. It's very powerful. The Buddha said it's one of the most powerful things to be attracted to the opposite sex at that time. Now, these days, that's a controversial statement, the opposite sex, right? So, but in any case, it's still relevant in the sense that it's sexual attraction, um, uh, sex itself, and, and that whole world of sexuality is very, very powerful. It's biological. It's natural, right? And it's funny because in Buddhism we talk about wisdom going against against worldly stream, against the against the flow. It doesn't go with the flow; it goes against the flow. Ignorance has its own flow. The world goes to its own flow. Wisdom has a diff goes against that flow. It's very interesting. Um, very interesting thing to reflect upon. So sexuality. Well, let's start off with the with the animal realm. Because that gives us context, I guess. So, as a monk uh, here in Thailand, like many other monks here in Thailand, when we go arms round in the in the morning, uh, here in Thailand, there's a lot of street dogs, um, you know, roaming around the streets and uh, you know, stray dogs and things like this. And uh, here, the owners tend to, um, like it used to be in Australia when I was growing up. The, you know, it was legal to have your dogs roam the streets, and uh, it wasn't wasn't a problem. Um, and you know, here in Thailand, they pretty much do. Not every owner lets their dog out on 
on the street and stuff, but it's it's a common thing, and you see it a lot in the morning, particularly when you're walking for arms round on the street. So when I look at their behaviour, you know, it's you, you can't avoid it. Um, you know, the dogs, you 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 know, they have an interesting behaviour. They they always trying to uh, pee on things for dominance, and uh, you can always tell, um, you know, when they're having an argument or a fight, <clears throat> they're always trying to. The male dogs are always trying to um, uh, enforce their dominance over the over, over the pack, so to speak. And the sexuality is really interesting too, because what happens when the when the, when the female dog uh, is on estra? I think that's the term now. It's not heat anymore. It's called estra or astra or something. So anyway, when the female dog the, the she, you, she'll lift her tail, she'll remove, she'll move her tail from the genitals. And the male dogs start, well, the male dogs start to compete, right? And uh, you see them fighting and whatever, and they tend to surround her, right? And usually the dominant male in the middle of everywhere without any shame, um, you know, they'll start doing their thing, right? And the other dogs will just sit sit by you know hoping to get a chance as well and you see this regularly you know and you don't have to be a monk walking the street in the morning to see this in thailand or any any country really this happens this is you know you see it in dog parks you know they'll just start mating anywhere so that's what dogs do that's what, what i'm trying to say so like there's this fight for dominance then they'll mate in any anywhere and the other male dogs will sit around and watch right so you know and then in the lion realm you know the 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 the, the lion will compete with other lions and he will has the rights to mate with three or four lionesses or five lionesses or two right and uh he will fight to the bitter end to have that right okay and when <clears throat> when he gets weak uh, and another male dominant, a very a more dominant male or a younger male comes along and throws his throw throws that uh, male off the throne, so to speak. Uh, excuse me, there's a lot of there's a few wasps around here, and it's it's been raining and there's a lot of mosquitoes. Quite humid today, so anyway, <clears throat> getting back on the subject. So the males, right? The male, the the lion, sorry. You know, the, the, the younger one will come and knock the older male off the throne eventually. And the females just give in. Like he, that, that younger male will also, if there's little lion cubs, he'll, he'll kill them in order to um, hasten uh, the lionesses into Easter or into heat or whichever the right term is, right? And this is acceptable in the animal realm. Well, acceptable in the sense that that's what occurs, whether it's acceptable or not. You know, that's hard to say. I mean, it's quite brutal, actually. But, you know, they, but then in, in the bird realms, in, you know, like penguins, they'll stay with the one mate for life. And certain birds will stay with one mate for life. And uh, so, you know, in every different animal realm, there's there's different kinds of behavior, right? <clears throat> but you see it with monkeys is too. There's always the, 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 the dominant male, particularly with baboons or even chimps. And uh, you know, he has the rights, he has the full rights to mating, as in the ape realm as well. So you see that a lot in these. So this is how animals behave. Now, what I'm talking about this is <clears throat> how do humans, how should humans behave, you know, on that level of sexuality, the same as animals? It's very interesting because the Buddha, when we go back to the Buddha and the Buddha's life, right, before he ordained and, um, when he was a teenager, 16, and he had the father built the three mansions. He had concubines. He had, he had a, you know, a, a wife, but he also had mistresses or concubines as most princes would have at the time. And you can see this even with the current king of Thailand who has four wives, right? Now, I'm not criticizing that. It's just, that's how it is. You know, whatever floats your boat, you know? So again, I don't tell people what to do with their life. Um, I'm not here to judge people, but there are consequences, you know. So as long as you're aware of consequences and as long as you hold yourself 
um, accountable to your own decisions and don't blame others, um, you know, that's fine, right? But the best thing is doing no harm, right? So anyway, it's, it's not uncommon for kings to have multiple wives, you know, throughout history and to have uh, harems like, you know, the, in, in Arab lands, a lot of the, uh, the kings and the princes and, and uh, they, they have harems, right? That's more of an Arab thing. In, and, you know, concubines is like a more Asian word, I think, for emperors would have concubines. So this is something that, you know, the most powerful man would have the rights to mating with many, many females, right? So this seems, seems to be part of human history as well. There's not much different to the animal realm, is it? So, but what's interesting is the Buddha, you know, when, when he decided to leave the palace and, and go on his uh, search, when, you know, when he decided to go and seek, he abstained from it completely. What caused this turn of events where you know, he had, you know, copious amount of activity on, on that front to going to the point to abstain completely, to abstain completely. This is very interesting, right? It's a very interesting concept. And why does Buddha suggest that um, it's in the, in, the five, in the first five precepts to abstain from sexual misconduct, in the eight precepts to abstain all sexual to abstain from all sexual activity altogether, right? Why is that, do you suppose? Is it, is it possible that being humans, uh, sexual activity is not really something we should be doing? Or is it because it uh, distracts us from the goal <clears throat> of cessation, realizing cessation of dukkha? This is very interesting, and I'm not going to answer that, I'm just posing it up to you. I'm just kind of teasing you right now. Now, I'll, I'll give you an answer in the sense that I can honestly say from my own personal experience, um, I've abstained now <clears throat> for 12, 12, for 12 reigns. Um, you know, uh, so uh, definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's not like I miss it. It's not like I, I mean, the bio, but you know, biologically, I'm not going to deny that biologically there's always the hormones going on and things like that but the thing is they're 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 impermanent you know and they come and they go they come and they go and it's not really any different to before being a monk the only thing is is i before being a monk i could act out on it that's the only difference really now health wise a lot of people always go there's you know there's a thing going around <clears throat> all kinds of philosophies that men should be you know, uh, releasing the sperm every two, once a month or something, because that's good for health. That's debatable. That's debatable. Because there's a lot of monks who live ripe old ages. You know, there's monks that have been ordained for 70 years, you know, 70 years or more, right? I know monks that have lived to 100, 108 um, in their 90s, and they've been monks for 50 years, 60 years. So, you know, if it was bad for your health, yeah, well, something would be happening there, but you know, so that's anecdotal. It's not scientifically proven, but I don't really agree with it. I think it depends. It, it all comes down to the mind, because if we just rely on biology alone, and you just react every time hormones take control, um, or hormones rise or whatever, um, you wouldn't behave be able to behave as a human being. It would it wouldn't um, give any sense to have consciousness or reason. Right, so reason, you know, it's kind of like you get angry or or you get uh, an emotional state, but your reason doesn't allow you to act out in certain in certain ways, right? And even on the expression of like testosterone or hormones, from a male point of view, or or even from uh, a female point of view, right, is that you know we've got hormones. Men, men tend to have testosterone. Women tend to have estrogen. It's not like you go around and and uh, you know decide to act upon it with any woman you see, right? Well, I guess those kind of people are in jail, right? They're in prison or about to be, okay? Because that's a crime. It's illegal to do so. But generally, what I'm saying, the, the, there is a mental component. There's the reason reason component that says, or the cognitive component, the rationale that says, well, yeah, I mean, I'm you know 
I'm feeling this, but you know, we, we have to behave ourselves. Okay. So there is the mental side of it, which is, uh, which is a bit different to the animal realm because when animals, when, when it comes to that time of the month, they'll fight for it. They'll do everything they can for it. Um, in terms of the male, the male, uh, the male arena and the females will wait for the dominant, right? In, in, in certain animal species and in others, um, it's, it's different, right? So, you know, how, where does the, uh, excuse me, where does the human behavior come in? You know, do we behave like animals, like the street dog, you know? So admittedly, as a teenager and, you know, when I used to uh, go out, go to bars, go to clubs, uh, hang out with friends and things like this and how I would behave, I don't think I was much different to how the, the street dog would be. You know, you would see it in bars and, and clubs, you know, we would you know, try to impress the woman and, and, you know, as much as possible, there'd be, you know, who would be more dominant. And you could see that sim it's a similar behavior, a little bit more subtle, a little bit more finessed, a little bit more refined, but, 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 but by and all, it's kind of the same thing, right? So where, is, where does sexuality lie and, and what is its purpose? So in terms of the world, in terms of the normal life, you know, it's, it's reproduction, you know, it's, it's reproducing human beings. And I guess it's pleasure seeking for, for most as well. But in terms of this life, in terms of the goal and the aspiration, why would the Buddha say uh, for monks and nuns that you would have to abstain from it completely? All right. Okay, so there's the reason why the rule was set uh, for se sexual abstination for monks is because uh, there was, you know, a monk, a monk uh, going around having sex, you know, before the Buddha put that rule in. We've got to keep this in mind. Apparently, from my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the first 20 years of the Sangha, there were, the, the Buddha didn't put forth any rules. There was no um, Vinaya, right? There was no discipline code. And then monks started to play up after that for some reason. And then the Buddha started to put in these rules. So that makes you wonder as well. So for 20 years, I guess you could say that monks didn't sleep around or anything. They didn't need to. Um, and why, And the Buddha stopped once he uh, <clears throat> left the palace and he started his practice. He abstained from all sexual activity completely. Right? So obviously... Uh, sexual activity, <clears throat> sexual activity uh, has its uh, benefits in the lay life, but in this life, um, in 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 the in the direction of uh, trying to engage in cessation of dukkha, I guess it's it's a, it's a moot subject. It should be, it, you know, it, it we should abstain from it altogether. Now, some people will agree with it. Some people won't. It doesn't really matter. It's pretty much accepted that uh, abstaining abstaining um, from sex um, is, is, is the general rule for monks, right? <clears throat> and nuns in, in the Buddhist Sangha, okay? So, so I guess the question is, you know, it's more about because the question is here, right, is it's more about the desire. It's more about that drive. It's more about understanding where the desire is coming from. Because I think lust Lust is one of the hardest things to, to go. It's probably the last thing to go before, uh, before dispassion and cessation occurs and final knowledge occurs. Because uh, lust is quite heavy. It's quite heavy and quite powerful. It's, quite, it's, very bi it's biological. It's very natural. And it's one of the most powerful forces there is, right? Um, between, you know, as human beings, sexu sexu sexuality is a huge subject. And I think we don't understand it enough. Right, there's not enough understanding of it. Um, there's not enough understanding on it on the hormone, hormone, hormonal level, the biological level, and there's not much understanding of it on the mental level. Right, but in essence, though, um, on this path, when you're trying to uh, develop and cultivate the 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 noble eightfold path, uh, the less distractions you have, the better. Right. And, and that's basically what it is to me, anyway, in my, in my opinion, about you know, sexual activity. 
But you know, I, I you know, I ask you to question it yourself. Like, uh, you know, start off with the animal realm. You know, watch some nature documentaries or go for a walk. You know, look, go sit in a forest or a park and just watch how animals behave. Um, and you'll see, you know, there's, you know, human beings. What's the difference between an animal and a human being? You know, it's our consciousness, is our abilities. So our sexuality should be more refined, should it not? I don't know. It's a question you can answer for yourself. But at least, you know, don't try not to behave like the street dog, you know, right? Because we're not dogs, we're humans, right? So I guess, you know, in terms of the five precepts, it's just being, um, it's being uh, like truthful, not engaging in deception, not using sexual activity or sexual acts for power or for gain. Yeah. Um, it's more about, I guess, with your one partner being um, loyal and being, you um, uh, what's what's it called? Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, faithful, being faithful with the with your partner, etc., etc. But uh, you know, it's horses for courses because the you know there was kings even in Buddhist times that had you know concubines and things like this, and there are kings that didn't. So I don't know. I don't know about King Bimbisara uh, at the time of the Buddha if he had just one wife or whatever. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, the 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 king before this one, <clears throat> the current king in Thailand, only had one wife and no, and didn't sleep with any other women, for example. But this king decides to do it like that. But you know, I guess in that case, um, you know, you're dealing with adults and it's consensual and there's no there's no deception. It's in you know, it's kind of like this is how it is, um, and so the person can choose. So there's, that's not really being, I guess, uh, it's not lying or cheating because both people know what's going on. So I guess in that case, it's hard to say whether that's sexual misconduct or not. I don't know. It's hard to, I really can't answer that question like straight down the line, you know. But uh, in general, what it is is just, you know, uh, be respectful and, and be courteous and, uh, you know, be accountable to your sexual actions, own your sexual actions. And be respectful and non-deceptive to the person that you're engaging in sexual intimacy with, right? And uh, not to cheat them and not to use sexual uh, activity for gain or for power or for, um, you know, for power in a bad way and a good, well, I guess there's not really any good way, like, you know, or like overpowering, if you know what I mean. So, you know, that, I guess that falls into the sexual misconduct category, right? But the other thing is, before I move on to the next subject, is the amount of time sexual activity um, and the amount of space it takes in the mental sphere that it takes, the whole game of, you know, the, the, the whole game of it, the whole interaction of it, the amount of time that's focused on it. That's the biggest difference I noticed as a monk is that I, I, I don't think about it, um, I don't, um, obsess over it like I used to before being a monk when I was out there in the dating market or you know when I was married or when I was single the amount of time I would focus on that um, and always being around you know someone I was attracted to the amount of focus it would take away from other things right so I, I honestly think it's it's a very skillful action if you're a monk for sure and if you really want to develop your your concentration and focus um, you know, it is, it can be quite distracting to you, you know, it can, it can be quite distracting. And I found it, I found um, what, when I get distracted is more the biological reaction sometimes uh, to certain. So I have to be careful. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an arahant. I'm not, uh, I have not cut all the taints and, and uh, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of bread to eat or a lot of rice to eat, a lot of bones to chew before that happens, I suppose. Um, hope it happens tomorrow really but you know it is what it is but sexuality I can honestly say is definitely a big distraction you know on the mental sphere the physical sphere the funny thing about it the physical sphere is very quick I mean it, it comes and goes really really quick you know it's not like you know it's it's like just a little part of the day but in the mind you know I've noticed that this this change in me since being a monk is like out there, the, the amount of time uh, that you spend, the amount of mental space, sexuality, 
um, takes in your mind is massive. It's huge. So I believe, you know, you know, having said that, that's pretty much why uh, one, at least one of the many reasons um, of the Buddha's wisdom to abstain from it. I mean, there's, I guess, there's other, re there's many other reasons, but one reason is is because the amount of space it takes in the mind, the amount of distraction, um, you know, it gives you in the mind. And I can on that I can honestly attest to, and I think I can confirm that because that's what really happens for me. Because when when it happens on a biological level, it doesn't it doesn't hang around long. It's the mental side of it. It's the mental side of it, the whole game about, the whole game, if you know what I mean. You know, as a monk, I can't be talking about you know, lewd and, and, you know, crass and talking about all this stuff, right? So please understand, right? You know, I have to be above board here, okay? So, but you know what I mean, right? So so that, that kind of uh, activity gets cast out and it allows you to focus more on the goal as well as all the other things we've got to cut out. Uh, in terms of the discipline as well. Um, so, you know, so then, you know, the next question that, well, the next topic I want to talk about is the identity box. I call it the identity box. So let's start off with what is identity? Well, it's this I am, you know, this is mine, this is myself, this is who I am, etc., 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 right? Now, in one, th one really, um, I think pertinent thing to understand, right, is that uh, at least in the tradition I follow, the five aggregates are not self. The Buddha talks very sternly that they're not self, and that includes the body. The body is not self. Feelings are not self. Perceptions, memories, they're not self. Fabrications are not self. Sankaras. And consciousness, consciousness itself is not self. Like, we don't own any of it right? It's not ours. It's just the human being is something that um, is, uh, is born and it dies, right? It's born and it dies. So it's impermanent, right? It's a nicha. And, you know, so the, the tilakana, nicha and dukkang, anatta, right? Anatta being not self, okay? Dukkang, I won't, won't go into today, right? But anatta, right? The, the fact that <clears throat> it's not self, right? So the body not being not self, so that means everything in the body, your eyes, the eyes, the teeth, the nose, the mouth, the tongue, the way you look, your hair, your bones. So mentally, mentally, your thoughts, your perceptions and your feelings, right, physical and mental feelings, they're not self. So there's always been... Um, even in Buddhist time, the, the, the Atman or the Atta, right? This I am, I am that, right? Uh, trying to, I guess, identify ourselves with a, with a tribe, with a culture and things like that. So on a social level, you know, the Buddha said, I come from the Sakya clan. So there is some kind of, um, you know, Sakya Muni, right? There is some kind of social thing, you know, with being identified with the tribe and all that kind of stuff. Uh, being identified, you know, as a man, male or female. And these days, it, that's all changing. Um, although I don't know if we're going in a good direction there. Don't know if it's helpful at all. Um, because perception is not self. And perception is also impermanent. So these, these sexual pronouns, for example, where you're perceiving yourself to be in a certain way, you know, they're changing all the time. And you can see it in people. You know, you can see it in people. I've seen people who were gay when they were young uh, and then change. And I've seen people who were straight turn to gay. So th that can change, right? That can change at any time. So you don't know for sure what it is because that's the nature of perception, right? The nature of perception. The nature of perception is impermanent and, it, and it's fleeting all the time. So to believe in that is dangerous. And also <clears throat> it's causes more delusion so the best thing on this path is to understand that identity is moot the box don't put yourself in the identity box understand that the five aggregates um, we need to uh, abandon clinging to the five aggregates which in our societies we, we don't really talk about that much but when I say that you know I've actually I've, I've got a bad habit of saying that I've got to stop saying 
one thing I've got to stop saying, and you can correct me in, in any other video, please put a comment up. Stop saying Western society in the Western world, right? Put it in the comments. <laughs> That's why you remind me when I'm, I'm saying. I've got to stop saying that because in even here in Asia, in my and, and not just in Thailand, like I've spent time in other Asian countries, it's not much different to Western countries. You know, they're, they're not, people aren't, you've got people that come here that aren't religious at all. You know, they're, they're like my uncles used to be in Italy. Um, you know, they, they don't, you know, they go to, they, they say, you know, they believe in Jesus, but they don't go to church. They work hard and they don't, you know, they don't pray and all that kind of thing. And they don't like going to church. There's a lot of Buddhists like that here in Thailand. You know, there's a lot of people like that. They just say, I'm a Buddhist just because they're a Buddhist and they'll go through the motions. But that doesn't mean um, they're practicing. And it's the same with a lot of Catholics as well. Now, I can't say that about other religions because I don't know about. I don't know. Right. I've got friends, of course, from different other from other groups. But I don't want to comment on them because, I, you know, I don't know. And, and, and this is anecdotal experience. I'm not talking about statistics and studies. I'm just talking about from what I've seen. Right. So, you know, the, our cultures are not that different, actually, I've noticed. You know, it's not really like in Thailand, everyone's a Buddhist. It's not like that, really, because in Thailand, there's a huge, they've got, you know, there's a huge sex industry. There's uh, alcohol. Alcohol is a big industry here. Drugs are a problem here, like everywhere else, right? So it's not like Thailand's got it sorted out because Buddhism is the main thing. It's not. It's not. That's why I keep saying, you know, there's not many people, there's not, the Sangha is not that big, right? It's not as big as people think, you know, there's, there's, aren't, there's, it's only a few and, and those who, have, who attain are even less. Okay, so what I was talking about with the identity box, right, how I got onto this, because I was talking about in Western nations, you know, and, and then I caught myself there. So I've got to get back on track here with the identity box. As far as the identity box goes, when you put yourself in a box all the time, that's also limiting to yourself because you're, you're saying, I'm this race, I'm this color. Well, the color you got no choice. But even myself, you know, like I'm usually white, but I'm, I'm getting, I'm brown now. So I don't even know whether I'm white or brown because I, I spend some time in the sun and I get quite, quite tanned, right? Some days more than others. And some of the ties here were saying to me, you're Thai, look how brown you are. Uh, you know, you don't even look Italian, right, or, or Australian, right? Well, I don't, certainly don't look Australian, but, uh, but you know, I, it's kind of like when you identify yourself with your bones and the bones are not self, you're already, you're already gone way off, way off course, right? So mentally, the perceptions, see, these perceptions, they keep telling you, you know, they keep telling you, you're this, you're that, and this is mine, this is myself, um, you know, and when you attach yourself to tangible objects out there, that's not very good as well. Material things um, that always causes a lot of grief and lamentation. Or when you attach yourself to other people, like this is. So now we're going into ultimate truth caveat. I'm talking about family, right? So when you attach yourself to your family, of course we love our family. Of course there's blood family. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. But when we die, they don't. We abandon them. I noticed that, you know, on my dad's deathbed, my father's deathbed a few years back, the whole, most of the family was around him at his deathbed. He had to say goodbye to everybody. So where does that leave us? So that's the ultimate truth, right? But that's not saying that you neglect your family because they're your family, because that doesn't exist, because ultimately it's all an abandonment. But ultimately it is. So you, you chew on that bone yourself. Like, you know, I'm not trying to answer that. It's a struggle, this one. This one, this is a real good definition of dukkha, of dukkha. Because when we get to the end of life, we abandon everything anyway. And every minute that passes is an abandonment of the previous moment. So what happened yesterday, it doesn't matter. We've abandoned it already. So life is about abandonment in a lot of ways, when you look at it from the ultimate like objective lens, right? So, but, you know, in the, in, so, but, Family, family itself, definitely is something important, this and that, but ultimately it means nothing in the end, right? 
So, you know, this is why it's dukkha. It's so confusing. It's even, you know, it's confusing to me how to, how to navigate through this, um, through this thing. But it's just comprehending dukkha and understanding the not-self factor. So the identity box, once you put yourself in an identity, you're limited to the identity. Like, I, f I found this myself growing up uh, because I came from, I was born in Australia and my parents were Italian and going through school was always very confusing. I, you know, people were saying, you're Australian and, and people saying, no, you're not Australian, you're, you're, you're a, you know, a, a derogatory term and this and that and it was a struggle and then through my teenage years um, I was rebelling and saying no I'm not I'm this and that and even up till now I'm still confused as to what nationality I am to tell the truth I really can't tell you it's hard for me to say I'm Australian yes I was born there it's hard for me to say I'm fully Italian I, I, you know I've got Italian parents but I didn't grow up in Italy right and then I moved to America and you know and I've been going back uh, back and forth uh, from Thailand for the last 12 years so who knows now like, what my identity is but that's a good thing I think because I'm not putting myself in that box anymore because I'm just going with the flow so what I've realized in this is humans are humans and the human entity itself when we go to ultimate truth right when we go to the ultimate what actually happens at the end is that this thing dies this machine dies. This this being dies. It no longer is. It no longer is. Right. It ceases to be. So it's all a lie. It's all a deception. It's just a. It's like a. It's like a dream in a sense that you know. You know you. You're going to pass on. So the, why why cling or attach to anything that comes along to it? Well, that's that's the bit. That's the big. That's the big question, isn't it? All right. So putting so much attention in, in the identity and put yourself in a box, you also limit yourself. So when you commit yourself and you say, well, I'm this race or I'm this nationality and you commit to it, well, you discriminate against others, right? And we see this in every country, right? Like you see even here, you see it in Thailand, but you see it in Australia, you see it in Europe, you see it in Arab lands. Never been there, but, you know, I've got Arab friends. They tell me what's going on there. It, it race this this is what happens when you identify as a certain race or a certain color you say certain things and you follow certain doctrines and it becomes it becomes us and them and that's really important to understand when you put yourself in the identity box it becomes us and them rather than go to the broader perspective of this is a human being here right and the buddha also says this i am this is myself this is mine is a delusion right it doesn't exist it's just a, it's it's just a perception it's not self it's anatta and this is one of the biggest doctrines that caused so much controversy even in the time of the, the when the buddha talked about anatta amongst all other practices was this doctrine of an anatta not self right caused a lot of controversy it still does today right because people i like to identify and rightly so in some circumstances, but when you under, but you know you want to talk about world peace, well then stop identifying yourself as a race or a color. You know, because once you put yourself into that box, you'll follow a certain doctrine or a certain paradigm. The idea is, is to realize that we're just skeletons, like you know we we have a skeleton like everybody else. We're just a human being with the six sense basis, and uh, we're going to die, and we're all the same in that. That's equality. We don't have to fight for equality. Equality is right there, right in front of you, right? So, so you know, we're all equal in that. So, you know, I think that's a better solution. I think anatta is a good solution for world peace because if people uh, reflected more on anatta instead of reflecting more on identity and confirming identity and making identity and sexuality such a thing and making it such a thing as, as opposed to uh, abstaining from it and just seeing it as not self, and learning to abandon the clinging to the five aggregates, you'd be much better off, I believe. And I can say this with conviction, practicing it. Now, again, I'm not trying to be overconfident or saying things like, you know, I'm going to be a monk for the rest of my life, you know, all these kind of things. I want to be careful. I don't want to say what's going to happen tomorrow. My, my big wish is, is I'm a monk till death. Don't know what will happen tomorrow. Because also there are two occasions where... Uh, 
you cannot be a monk. And that's when there's a war on and when there's a famine. So who knows what will happen tomorrow, guys, friends, you know. So I don't want to talk. I've seen, you know, what I thought were really good monks uh, disrobe at 38 reigns, at 30 reigns, at 20 reigns, at 15 reigns, at 10 reigns, at 6 reigns. And I really thought some of those monks were really going to, uh, you know, go somewhere and really get there and they disrobe. So, you know, that could happen to me. I don't want that to happen to me, but I also don't want to jinx myself and I don't want to be overconfident. I just want to stay humble on that and just say, that's my wish, to stay in the robes till I die and I'll do everything I can to stay in the robes. But again, you know, like coming back to the, the, the identity box because I got off track there, um, the identity box, if you put yourself in that box and you confirm it to be, you're confirming atta. You're not going into anatta, right? So you're going back into avidya, right? So the five, uh, so the five uh, aggregates, the bots, like if, if fabrications, consciousness, perceptions and feelings are too abstract for you, stick with the body. Usually, we, that's that's one of the me first meditations the Buddha taught was the 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 meditate the reflection on the body. That's the first meditation, and then there was Anapanasati, the, the one on breath, and then the forty other the thirty eight other objects, right? Or the forty objects of meditation. But the the reflection of the body was one of the first practices the Buddha taught, and and for good reason because it's a good way to start. It's tangible. You can you, you can feel it. You can sense it. You can see it. Um, and you know it's it, it you start there when you look at your teeth like you want to identify as handsome or pretty or whatever but you look at your eyes and you look at the impermanence of when you're younger to as you get old and how it all declines you wouldn't allow that to happen if you owned it if it was yours i certainly wouldn't i want all my teeth um you know i've, I've got big problems with my teeth i would stop that immediately if i could but you can't, right? Because that's that's part of the, the, the process of impermanence, the law of impermanence, right? So going to anatta and you start to, you know, your teeth, they're not yours, right? When you die, if you go to the cemetery or you go to any morgue or you look at any dead person, the body just, you know, that's it. It goes in the grave or it goes, it gets cremated. That all dies. So how can you claim authority on it? in any way you know how can you claim that it's yours or identify with it you know so this is one big thing that's missed um, particularly from groups that want to attack buddhism because they think we're we're we're, we're identifying people or discriminating against other people well then i would say to the people that are practicing that philosophy you're not practicing buddhism and you don't understand not self because the first thing, if someone comes to me, no matter what sexuality or what pronoun they are or what or who they are, whether they're gay, straight, lesbian, all those kind of subjects, I don't really care. I'm going to say to that person, stop. Sit down, concentrate. You know, stop clinging to your aggregates. Understand your body. Understand what you are as a human being. That's the first thing I would say. Yeah, I'm not going to sit there and, and, and modicoddle identity and race and all these kind of things because it's irrelevant. Yeah, the way I see it is, you know, you we have compassion and we have goodwill for all human beings because I'm a human being myself. I'm just a bag of bones. You know, my bones are in a sack of flesh, right? In the in the dirty sack, as they say in in some in some suttas, uh, Mahayana, I think. Right, Tibetan one, right? The the dirty sack, the filthy sack, right? So this is just the filthy sack right here, right? Or the feces and urine and everything else. So, you know, I have the same, you know, every other human being, it doesn't matter who they are, it's pretty much the same. So, you know, there's no contempt or, or you know, conceit or prejudice because it's just, we are what we are. The idea is to understand what the Dharma is all about and what we're trying to do. And the, what we, the goal is, is to realize cessation. The goal is dispassion, cessation, to comprehend the Dukkha, not to make the Dukkha, to, to actually try to make a perception of self 
real. The idea is to disband from it because the identity box is a small thing. It's not wide. It doesn't give you a wide scope. It also doesn't. It also limits your choices, and limits the amount of people you can talk to. Because when you're really stuck in the identity, you'll just stick with your crowd or your tribe, and you won't you won't branch out. You won't open your mind. You won't um, seek an, uh, antagonizing opinions or views. You won't grow. You know, you're just going to be hom homogenous and ethnocentric, and that in itself is quite big problem in this world no i'm not saying there's no reason for you know countries and states i mean there's there's a there's a good reason for that um because from the organizational and from the harmony point of view but ultimately as you evolve and you're trying to go to beyond the six senses that becomes that becomes moot you're like the buddha you know the buddha compassion for all living beings right we're trying to get bigger here we're trying to reach our full capability right uh, we're trying to get into chitta power, your, 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 your chitta power. We're trying to get into understanding who, what, what our essence is, what, what the true nature is. Not the false nature, not the atta, not the self, right? We don't want to follow that path. We're trying to follow the path of not self. We're trying to disband from all the ignorance. We're trying to drop all the ignorance and the stuff that causes all the greed, hate and delusion in the world. You know, let's get that straight. Perception can cause a lot of greed and hatred, right? A lot of delusion. It can cause a lot of problems, and it does cause a lot of problems, right? So, so this is one big thing that we need to focus on, uh, because the identity box, as well as sexual misconduct, sexuality, can cause a lot of problems, a lot of problems in our lives. So we need to get to our minds around it and understand what it actually is, and we need to study it. Right? We need to study it, analyze it, and understand the behavior. Why? Right? So going back to uh, concluding on the identity box, the main thing is to understand that your perceptions are, are impermanent. So when you, when you have a perception of something, I'll give you a very basic example. When you're five years old, you perceive things in a certain way. Right? If someone takes away your chocolate candy, you'll cry. Or... Maybe not your chocolate candy, depending on where you grew up. Maybe they take away your piece of bread or whatever you've got, right? Um, and you have a certain attachment to certain things. When you're 10 years old, that perception changes. When you're 15 years old, that perception changes. Your worldview changes every, you know, every day, actually. I'm just using a very crude example of every five years, you know, to the time you're 80. But then what happens, you know, before you get married, when you're married, and, and like if you're divorced or if you lose your spouse, right? Before you have children, after you have children, before you study a degree, during the degree, then after the degree. You know, when you're in high school, when you're in university, or when, you're in certain, when you have certain experiences, your perception changes. How many times do you hear stories of someone saying, well, this when this happened to me, I stopped doing that, right? You know, you hear it from... People from criminals, you know, once I went to jail, you know, I found God or I found Allah, you know, or I found Buddha. And since then I've changed my way because now I've realized it's not the right way to go. Or as I grew up thinking this way, right now, I realize it's wrong because that's the nature of perception. It falls under the principle or under the law of impermanence. It comes and goes and the feelings are not far, are, are the same. You know, you feel pain, you don't feel pain. You feel pleasure, then you don't feel pleasure. You feel bored, then you don't feel bored. That you, you feel depressed, then you don't feel depressed. You, you, you know, there's all, all kinds of things going on in that realm, you know, that are elusive and non-tangible, but they're there, right? So the, the idea with the identity box is to understand identity is the same. Like, I, you know, I can honestly say from my own experience, from my clinical experience as an acupuncturist before being a monk and as a monk, right, I can say, you, you know, like, the perception of myself, like who I am today, when I look back at, in my 20s or in my 30s or in my teenage years and I look at the things that I did, I'm just like, where was the logic? What was I thinking? How come I did that? Because now I wouldn't do those things. Do different, right? Or I think I would do different, right? So who knows in 10 years' time what I'm going to be thinking or what this body is or, or what the human being is. Who the hell knows as I progress on progress on this study on this development and cultivation 
of, of, of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path and Buddha's Dharma, right? So th these things, these perceptions, when you're studying yourself, like if you, when I look back 30 years ago, I wonder, I scratch my head most of the time thinking, why did I do that? Why did I, how come? What, what caused that? When, when I talk to people that remind me of those, of what happened or certain things, I go back and I say, yeah, well, I'm not sure what happened there. How come I did that? Yeah, I wouldn't do that today because I've been sober for the last 12 years or more, right? And I've been on the straight and narrow. And I mean sober, if you've watched my previous videos, I'm not talking sober as in just from drugs and alcohol and those and stimulants. I'm talking sober from toxic thinking, right? To uh, sober from toxic behavior, right? You know, I've been detoxing all that out of my system, right? And it gives you a whole different perception. Now, this perception that I have now is not to be counted on. I don't want to count on it. But what I can say, like internally, you know, am, am, do, I, do, I, do I have a sense of uh, betterness? Do I have a sense of improvement? Sure, sure, you know. But, you know, I haven't reached the goal, so it's hard to say. Like I'm climbing a mountain. I'm still not at the peak yet, right? So we'll make that decision once we get to the peak, okay? But things are looking good. Things are looking good. And, and I feel much better. Um, if you want to talk into the feeling realm, it's it's much better. Although my life is difficult, I've put myself in this situation like every other monk. And that's another thing, friends. I don't want to distinguish myself from any other monk. Um, just a plain old Jane. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not here to try to, uh, you know, out-talk or, 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 or push my position. Um, I do have a pretty large family. I do have a lot of friends in a lot of places. Right, and I run this channel to, to reach out because I do get the support from a lot of people, right? So I do this as a, as, as a token um, to, to give back as well. And people are watching this, right? And, and I get feedback. So, and people are encouraging me to keep doing this. So that's why I'm doing it, right? So, but, but, but you, know, in, you know, in the end though, the best thing to understand about, you know, when we're talking about identity is let's keep it simple it's not self so whatever you think you are when you die right what happens after that you're not that you're not that anymore you're not everything you thought you were now so when you die that all goes out the window so keep that in mind you know keep that in mind you know like ultimately you know once once the body is gone once the body is deceased right once it's deceased you know all this has been a, you know whatever you thought of who you were and all that it's all a big delusion it's it's all just a perception i mean what i'll finish like when i used to talk to my father in his later years when he used to when i used to visit him and he used to grab me by the hand and take me into his little study into his study with all his books and his um his his nice nicely organized desk and he's had his magnifying glass and a certain light it was quite quite cute actually but he would tell me he would tell me about you know his state of mind and how he thinks differently now and and he reflects upon all these mistakes and what he was thinking and why and he would find all the faults in in his character because he wasn't very um i would say my dad was quite depressed towards the end there like i'm not saying he had depression as an illness but he had the depression qualities depressive qualities I, I would say um and you know he was not very happy all the time he was upset and he um he felt in some cases like a failure right because of missed opportunities and things like this i'm not going to go any further because i have a lot of respect for my father but i'm just talking about the way he felt about himself not that i saw that in him but it was interesting because you're seeing a man who worked hard who had a family, who was quite successful with the family, who had reasonable success out there. Um, but he, you know, he worked hard. But it was interesting seeing his thoughts in his later life, particularly in, in the last few years of where he was mentally, right? And then, you know, especially when he used to say things, look, I, shit, I'm 90 years of age. I don't know anything anymore. Like, who knows? Who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? I don't even know. You know, so that tells you a lot, you know, and I would, I would consider my dad a quite a wise person, not in a Buddhist sense, but in a worldly sense, he's quite wise, 
is quite experienced in a worldly sense because my dad was an atheist, right? But, you know, it, it, that tells you a lot about perception of what you think. You know, it's it's you can say whatever you like, but once your your faculties start to shut down when you get old, like you can barely walk, right? You may not have your teeth, you can barely eat, and all those things. You're going to have a different perception of who you are or, or what you are. So be careful of perception. You know, don't believe it. Try to stop. Try to abandon the clinging to the five aggregates and and um, reflect on that during your your concentration practice particularly when you're practicing vipassana. Reflect a lot on the five aggregates. Reflect a lot on the clinging to the five aggregates and start with the body. And you'll see that your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your teeth are not yours. They're just simply not yours. It's not self. Ultimately, when we die, it gets dropped. So you can't, when you, you can't loop out of this. You can't loop out of this. So don't understand why there are certain groups who insist on, um, you know, advocating that, uh, you know, identity, 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 and 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 bring that to Buddhism when Buddhism, when the, when the path of Buddhism has absolutely nothing to do with identity. In fact, it's the nemesis. It's antagonistic in a lot of sense because what we're trying to do is shed it. What we're trying to do is abandon clinging to the five aggregates. The five aggregates contain identity, right? Anyway, I think I spoke. A lot today and um, you know uh, I've got a bit of time on my shoulders right now uh, work has slowed down a bit donations have dried up so we are you know uh, we, we have to stop work for a while um, and so so I've got a little bit more time to be able to do a lot longer videos and I didn't have to get, uh, produce my phone number or personal details in order to do longer videos on YouTube so this is why I'm doing them I can even put up a cover slide now, but I'm too lazy to do that. So, you know, before you couldn't do that. You had to, if you wanted to do a video for longer than 15 minutes or have a cover slide, you have to give your phone number and another deed. And I just refused to do that. So for some reason, they're allowing me to do that. Hopefully, this, I don't jinx myself by saying this, right? But in any sense, uh, you know, thank you uh, for supporting me and, and uh, this channel. If you feel that you... If you feel that this channel is useful to you and you feel that it would be useful to others, please share it. Um, you can I, uh, I already mentioned again, um, my Telegram group, I've reopened it, um, but I would prefer to grow Buddhists for Truth, the website. Um, I think that is more skillful in the long run, uh, better than having um, apps or any other thing. Well, we can have our own app, um, and that way we can keep use open source um, open source uh, uh, programming and, and you know not worry and not ask people for all their privacy details and have all the and have data um, data mining and all that so that's something I'd, I'd like to do in the future so if you're behind that and would like to create help create a, a Buddhist online community um, please join Buddhist for truth subscribe to that um, at the moment I, I'll, I'll uh, you, you there's there's different memberships but but, you know, bear with me. That's going to change just like perception. I'm just trying to work it out. We're trying to do it on our own. So it might be something you're interested in. Um, if you want to talk to me straight for now, uh, because we haven't got the technology on Buddhist for Truth right now, I mean, we can talk on the forum and through comments. But if, uh, you know, sometimes I do live streams and you want to talk to me in person from time to time, uh, join my Telegram group. Um, join my Telegram group. I have two Telegram groups. Um, one is the temple that I'm staying at. I've created a telegram group for that, and that's temple related, uh, temple related, right? So I don't do my live streams on that. I do live chanting on that once a week, but on my personal, because I don't know if I'm going to stay in this temple for the rest of my life. So I've got a personal group, uh, for the people that, uh, want to associate with me. Um, and, and, and contact me and, and uh, support me and also um, we help me grow as well. We can uh, exchange ideas and, and uh, discussions and things like this. On that, on, that, uh, on that chat group, you know, I, I post messages and I do live streams from time to time um, and I answer questions and things like this. So if you're interested in that, please see the link or the three links in the description which I'll put up. 
and uh, thanks again for all your support and may you grow in Dharma. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share with your friends.